The title of today's message is Firemen. Obviously, there are firewomen as well, but uh, I actually remember being a kid, and maybe you did this as well. They'd have you draw pictures of what you wanted to be one day, and it was either a policeman or a fireman. Uh, I think little did I know what that involved when I was a kid. Uh, we talk sometimes like about back in the blue, um, but firemen are interesting animals, interesting people. Uh, and anybody that signs up and takes the test and the whole reason is to go fight fires, uh, that's pretty intense. Literally running into a fire to either save property or people, um, endangering their own lives many times. So I appreciate so much uh, the people that I hope I never need, right? In my mama's house, I remember her telling me when she was a little girl that her house burned to the ground. Um, so it's one of those things you want around, you want these people around, you want them ready, you just don't want them coming to your house. Um, there's another kind of firemen. Uh, I've shared this uh, along the way. I don't know if I'd have been more dangerous, um, but when you raise three daughters, you find out things about women way too late. Right? Um, and there's a phrase about a person, and you may have heard this phrase. Someone may say, man, he is just fire. Or she is just fire, right? Just literally on fire. Do you know what that means? Fire, right? Krista, you married somebody on fire, right? You married fire. So if you think about yourself spiritually, is that a word that would be used to describe you? He, she, man, they are just fire. On fire for God. Um, would run into a house just, just who this person is. Who are these fire men and women? Talk about men today. Um... I'd like to start in 1 Kings chapter 18. Now, I don't know if you go back and read the Old Testament. I've actually heard of pastors that just say, well, that's the Old Testament. Totally ignore it and only preach out of the New Testament. I don't know what they're thinking because you find out who God is so much of the time in the Old Testament and what he has capacity for physically, not just spiritual battles, but physical battles and things that happened. Elijah. And I'm not going to go read every, it would take a while to get all this, but um, Elijah prays that it's not going to rain, and it doesn't rain for three plus years, and the, and the nation's in trouble. Finally, at the end of this period, uh, 1 Kings 18, verse 1, and it came to pass after many days that the Lord of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. Um, let me give you a little bit of a clue as to the best way to pray. Let God tell you what to do and then ask him to do it. You say, well, what does that mean? Don't be jumping out somewhere. The safest place to start when you're praying is, you know what, Lord, before I even get started, what do you want? I can tell you and you already know what I think I want, but I don't want what I want anymore. I want what you want. So what do you want? And then I'm going to ask for that and this is all going to be fine. A lot of times we are pounding on the door of heaven asking him for things he does not intend to give us. And sometimes he answers our prayers and we wish he hadn't. Uh, I think of men and women who beat the door down of heaven and say, God, give me this man, give me this woman. I want to marry this person. And he says, not that he would say this, but okay, you know. Um, there you go. And now you don't want that person. I thought that was the person you begged God for. So Elijah goes to Ahab, and God's already told him, I'm going to send rain on the earth. But before this happens, Elijah goes and there's a, there's a throwdown showdown with all these prophets. Um, so go down in the story here. Uh, let's go down to verse 14. 
And now you say, go tell your master Elijah is here. He will kill me. Then Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely present myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that that Ahab said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. In other words, these gods. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel. Tell everybody to meet at Mount Carmel. The 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at at Jezebel's table. Do not name your daughter Jezebel. I don't care who tells you it's in the Bible. Don't name your kid Jezebel. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And then look at the end of verse 21. And the people answered him not a word. That's a problem. That's lukewarm, that's not fire. That's, well, we're afraid to say one or the other, so we're gonna say nothing. You cannot live the rest of your life that way. You you can, but you shouldn't be able to. If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, follow him. The people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men, so I'm outnumbered one to 450. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. Then you call in the name of your gods and I will call in the name of the Lord and the Lord God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it's well spoken. We're in. Sounds good. So let me, let me just ask you a quick question. What has your God provided you recently? You say, what do you mean? God's my God. If he were your God, you'd go back up there, you'd be following his commandments and what he says. You must have found somebody better. And when you call out to him, what does he deliver? Chaos. Pain, suffering. That's what the enemy delivers. You say, well, I'm not worshiping the devil. Then, then what are we doing? So they all agree. Verse 25, now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves, prepare it, prepare it first for your many, and call on the name of your God and put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given to them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon saying, oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped upon the altar which they had made. And so it was as at noon that Elijah mocked him and said, now this is high noon. These guys have been 450 of them going crazy trying to get Baal to do something. He mocks him and says, cry aloud for he is a God. Either he is meditating or he is busy. Or he is on a journey. Maybe he took a trip. Or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. And when midday was passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the stones of Jacob, to whom the word of the, of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seas of seed. And he put the wood, on, wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. In other words, this isn't good enough. I need it wet. Then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. They did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar. And he also filled the trench with Walter, with Walter is not in the Bible, by the way, with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, no cutting, no jumping around on the altar. 
comes near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood, now look at this, and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now that's a fireman right there. You say, well, how did he do that? He trusted God. You say, well, how does that apply to my life? What was God after? Look at the last phrase up there in verse 37. And that you have turned their hearts back to you again. So where have our heart, where do our hearts go? They're not on fire anymore. Lukewarm at best sometimes, or with men especially, if you're not on fire for Jesus, you're, there's a good chance you're on fire for something else. There's fire somewhere. And it's a consuming kind of fire. And then you're in trouble passions of the flesh, whatever it may be, then you got a problem. So what is God trying to do? Just come back. Why, why do you go after these false gods? Um, I saw a picture this week of a, uh, some kind of, some Indian goddess or just these weird things. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I, I, you know, again, I'm not being critical of somebody. You cannot pray to a rock. Okay. You can pray to the rock. You cannot pray to a rock and get anything out of it. You can put one in your house. I actually have a friend. I went in his house and he had a, a Buddha of some kind in the house as a decorative piece. I said, dude, I'd get, that out of, I'd get that out of my house. He said, oh, it's just decoration. Let me tell you something. Idols are not decoration. I don't want them in my house. I've literally gone through my house before and said, Lord, is there anything in this house that needs to go? Because it's a problem. Keep reading this story. The fire consumes everything. Verse 39. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord he is God. The Lord, he is God. They wouldn't say anything a minute ago, but then fire falls. What is it going to take for us to say the Lord, he is God? What do you got to see? What's got to happen? And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kish, Kishon and, and executed them there. Then Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So, uh, so Ahab went up to eat and drink and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and he said, there's nothing. And seven times he said, go again. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there's a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. It's about to rain so much your chariot won't make it through. Now, you say, well, that's Old Testament, that's some prophet. Let me tell you about New Testament. The way I read scripture, the God who created the entire universe when I was six years old and prayed a simple prayer moved into this physical body and he has not left me yet. I do not have God with me, I have God in me. What does that make possible? You walk into a room, there's light. It can be a dark room. You walk in, you are the light of the world, the scripture says. Unless we've hidden it under some kind of basket, trying to mask it and hide it. Um, I don't know why this comes to mind, but I, had a, I, I used to work with a guy, and he would go on business trips, and I'm not sure I can do it. He would go into a bar, and he would take his ring off, Put it in his pocket so he could be single at the bar even though he was married. Dude, I got a scar on my hand. I couldn't hide from anybody if I tried. 
I mean, I literally have an indentation. The guy that said, sweetheart, I can't wear this wedding ring. It's cutting off my circulation. She said, it's supposed to. So, you know, (laughs) that's. uh... So there's the picture. Now ask yourself this question. When you go out into the world, do you wear your ring or do you not wear it when it comes to Jesus? Now, in my case, I don't take it off. So I don't have to wake up and decide whether I'm going to be married today or not. I'm married no matter what. and don't have a problem with that. I'm married. I'm not trying to tell someone I'm not married. So you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you going to do now? And what is possible and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of these things, and I'm telling you, I'm going to have to give an account for this one day when I'm going to meet Jesus. I think there is way more possible than even I know about. And I'm probably going to get to heaven, and he's going to go, okay, so what was so hard about asking, knocking, seeking, and all this stuff I wrote down? And you preached up to this edge, but you didn't keep going. You were afraid. You didn't want to mislead someone. Uh, But dude, I'm God. Why didn't you ask? Just take a shot. Okay, I didn't know I was going to tell this story. I can't take it anymore, so I'm going to tell it now. So my wife and I buy a house, got the kitchen, and she decides she wants a farmhouse sink. Farmhouse sink it is. So I want to get her a nice farmhouse sink. So I find one on this Facebook thing, Marketplace, in Weatherford, Texas. This guy's got the Mac Daddy farmhouse sink. And he wants more than I'm willing to pay, so I offer it and sit on it. Finally, after about six weeks, he farmhouses up and says, okay. So we get in the car. And we drive to Weatherford, Texas, from downtown Dallas, Texas, to pick up our farmhouse sink. So we get to Fort Worth, Hewland Street, and I'm in the center lane. I look over in the left lane, there's a car ahead of me. And then I glance ahead and see a gnarly looking piece of log tree that has fallen probably out of somebody's trailer into the road. This guy can't miss it. And I see... His front right tire hit it, and I'm thinking, he's disabled. It flipped him that way, threw him that way. And then in a millisecond, after he hit that log, it came flipping up and was coming right in my windshield. And I don't know, people say their whole life flashes, whatever. I didn't get that far, but I I thought, I, I closed my eyes and I ducked. Because I thought, it's coming in, and I literally thought, I'm either about to be dead in the hospital, the back of an ambulance, but there's really no way around this, and I braced for impact. It caught the front left headlight, boom, hit that thing, crushed the hood, the headlight, the quarter panel, and I kept going. It flipped over the car. I exited. The car was still running. I couldn't get out. Had to climb over on Rebecca's side. Went around. I thought... We're alive. And then I got a word I can't say. At least I don't use it in sermons yet, but I'm praying about it. It starts with a P, and I was not happy. Because I realized somebody is trying to kill me and keep me from getting to weathered for Texas, not to my sink, but to somebody that owns that sink. So now I'm mad. I'm grateful that I'm alive. The car's running. I said, let's go. We get in the car and go to, go to Weatherford. Pull up in front of this guy's house. He sees the car, I guess. And out from the back of the house on a dolly is this giant farmhouse sink. You could, you could bathe triplets in it. I don't know what we're going to do with it, but we, you know. 
He's got it on a dolly pushing it. He gets to the back of my car and uh, we load it in the back together and then I showed him my car and we're standing with the back of the car up and I looked at him, his name is Matt and that's the name of the sink now too, by the way. And I said, Matt, I said, I don't know who you are and what's going on with you. But I almost died coming over here to get this sink from you and I don't think it's about the sink. I think it's about you. And I looked at him and said, if you drop dead right here in front of your house, where would you go? He said, oh, that's a big question. 40-year-old guy, two kids, wife. I said, where would you go? And he said, well, I think I'd go up. And I said, why do you think that? Well, I've been a nice person. He started and I said, nope, that's not the answer. Just interrupted him. That's not going to work. I said, dude, that's like praying. You're hoping that you have cowboy tickets and going season tickets and going to the gate and saying, I'm here, I want in, I hope I have tickets. I said, dude, they're not letting you in, you gotta have a ticket. I said, here's how you get to heaven. And I shared the gospel with him. I said, has anybody ever explained this to you? And he said, no. I said, would you like to do that right here in front of your house? He said, I would. And we prayed and he became a Christian. I said, call your mama. Got her on, he had her up, I said, no, I wanna hear this. Got her on speaker. And he told her, turns out his neighbor, his neighbor's a youth director. He's had people praying for him. And he was like, man, he couldn't believe it. Now, he said, why'd you tell that story? You got to bring some fire up in here. You got to stop being discouraged by attacks. This is a war. You say, they're shooting at me. Of course they're shooting at you. It's a war. What did you think? I just wanted my little ticket to heaven. No, it's not just a ticket to heaven. This is a war, and there's people's lives at stake. And I looked at this guy, Matt, and I said, Matt, this is how much God cares about you. He may have led us to buy an old house, gut the whole thing. My wife won a farmhouse sink, and the whole reason for the whole exercise was to get us here to you today, and that's it. That's how much God cares about you. Are you willing for that to be the reason? You say, well, it's not, I'm in a bad spot. Okay, Jesus ended up in a bad spot. Somebody agrees. You say, well, what about your car? What about my car? We can get the car fixed. So then I take it to get it fixed. And I go into the Enterprise Rental Car Office, and they're going to give me a car. And I say, how long have you been in Dallas? Two days. So I start talking to him. I'm like, well, you can't live that every day all the time. And tell me where you got a verse that says you can't. How are you living? And how's that working out for you? What are your gods doing for you? How much fire are they bringing on your life? How much demonstration in my life consistently is there that God lives in me and that he's trying to do something and he's, he's able to do it? And I tell you plenty of stories about me getting in the way. I have days I get in my car and I don't want to listen to the Christian music. And so I find me some Led Zeppelin or whatever it is I want to listen to at that moment. He said, Led Zeppelin, I grew up somehow, my parents had no idea who Led Zeppelin was, and we had one record, and we'd shoot pool, the three of my, my brother and sister and I, and we're out there listening to, I got a whole lot of love, or whatever it was, we had no idea what they were talking about, but we had a Led Zeppelin record, and we listened to it thousands of times, and should never have had that in our heads, but anyhow, um, right, you're doing the same thing. So you wake up and you say, Lord, today there's mats out there. There's people out there. There's people, as we're sharing the prayer time, there's people to pray for. I got to stand in the gap. I got to be the person that intercedes for that young teenage girl. Or they may not make it. I will skip that one. How much time we got? How much time you got? You got a minute? Go to Daniel chapter 3. Gosh, these are great stories. This is, I'm, I'm reading you stories about the same God that lives in me. Right? It's not a different God. 
Same God, same name, lives in me. And this background on this one is they're trying to trap Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, get the king. You know, he builds this big idol. Everybody's got to bow, the, crank the music up. And if you don't bow, you get thrown in a fiery furnace. So D Daniel chapter 3, go down to verse 16. They get caught not bowing. And you know, by the way, that's what you want to have happen. Get caught not bowing. The world says, well, this is what you're supposed to do. And you say, I'm out. I'm not bowing to that. I am not doing that. Daniel 3, 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. In that is, if that is the case, you know, you're going to throw us in the fiery furnace. Okay. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. So number one, he can deliver us from the fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. In other words, either we're about to be delivered from the fiery furnace or from you. But one of those two things is going to happen. And if we get delivered from you, we'll be with God, we'll be dead. But either way, you're not in control. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Say that to your country. Say that to your politics. Say that to your wokeness. We're not doing it. And what our culture says, oh, this is what everybody's doing. Stop doing what everybody's doing. Get you a verse to back up what you're doing. And I know I get clobbered for this. I, I don't care how many laws you pass, you will never legalize marriage in the eyes of God. It ain't going to happen. We've lost our minds. We're, we're so advanced, we've made same-sex marriage legal. And it's the same country that made owning peoples legal. The same crazy people. Well, they passed a law. They could pass a law, you can go 200 miles an hour down the freeway. That doesn't mean you have to go 200 miles down the freeway. Well, that's what the sign said. You don't have to go that fast. I'd actually enjoy that personally, but that's another conversation. So go back to what they're saying here. We're out. We're not going to serve your gods. We're not going to worship the gold image you've set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression of his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind, okay, it gets very important, to bind, tie them up, to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They died throwing them in the fire. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose, he gets up off his throne, <laughs> and he's close enough to the fire to see what's going on, obviously. Arose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? We threw three in, right? They answered and said to the king, oh, true, O oh king. Look, he answered, I see four men, and this is a big piece of the story. I love this word. I see four men loose. Now there's your word. You got three guys thrown in a fiery furnace, kills the guys throwing them in, and the three guys, there's four guys now, and they're all loose. Who untied them? Pretty nice when Jesus shows up and unties you in the fire. Pretty nice. Get you some of that. Lord, I'm in trouble. I'm all tied up with a sin or whatever this situation is. He goes, I'm here. And I'm not just with you anymore. I'm in you now. Old Testament, I was with you. I could be on someone, Holy Spirit. But now I'm in you. I'm about to untie you. 
I'm with you. I'm in you. This is going to be okay. I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. Now, where are they going? Oh, let's walk around in the fire. And they, were, they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Um, you, got a, you got a fire so hot, it's killing people, throwing people in. And somehow you can see the fourth new person because they are like the Son of God, meaning you can see him brighter than the fire. Has Jesus ever shown up in your fire? I got a buddy in the room today. His little girl was born. They did what was supposed to be a simple procedure. The new doc doing it used an adult needle instead of a child's needle and almost killed her. And she's 40-something years old. How? 36 today. Never was the same. Healthy little girl, everything fine. You say, well, where's God when that happens? Same place. You say, well, why does God let these things happen? I don't know. Ask him. I don't want to talk to him. I'm back to the P word, angry. So what are you going to do? What did he do? He and his wife. You finally get to a place, and you've only got a few options. You either kill yourself, you curse God and just wait to die, just be bitter and angry, or you do what Scripture says and say, okay, I don't get this, but no matter what, I will trust you and I will thank you. And let's see what you bring from this. You say, I'm not interested in that. Let me tell you something about becoming a Christian. You signed up for the package. The whole thing. You say, I did not sign up for that kind of suffering. Yes, you did. You say, well, I don't want that kind of suffering. It's not your choice. Now, I can tell you this. My friend in this room and his wife would not be the same people if it would not have been for what God allowed to their little girl. I don't understand it. And there's unspeakable tragedy in people's lives. But you have to help them get to Jesus, get Jesus, and then hold on to Jesus. And one of the best ways to do that is show them how you got to Jesus, that you got Jesus, and you're holding on to Jesus. And they say, well, I know a little bit about you and what you're going through and what you've gone through. If he can sustain you, I'm going to have to let him sustain me or I'm not going to make it. And before you jump someone who's in trouble, just maybe ask a few questions. Why does someone do drugs? Why does someone drink? He said, oh, he's just a drunk. She's just a drunk. He's just a drug addict. He's just a loser. Ask a couple of questions. Hey, how are you doing? Not so good, maybe. Um, how's your life been? You just listen long enough, people tell you where their pain is. Like a horse whisper runs his hands down the back of that horse. Where it twitches, something's up. Some pe- sometimes people can't get out of the fire. And then you show up. Um, in Job's case his buddies showed up and did, they did the right thing for seven days they sit down and no one says a word for seven days you know why they didn't say anything for seven days because there's nothing to say you can't fix it sometimes you just got to be there
All right, we'll skip some of these and let's, let's, sh let's shut it down with Ephesians chapter 6. If you want to know, I was going to read you 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 Peter 1. You're on your own. Ephesians 6. First part of this, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. You want, it, you want things to go better and live a long time? The first commandment in the Old Testament that has a, a promise attached to it is what? Honor your father and mother. Verse 4, and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Are you doing that as a dad? Are you provoking your children? Let me tell you a simple way to provoke your kids. Tell them not to do something that you do. That's pretty simple. I make them crazy. So I can't do it, but you can And then he gets into verse 10. Finally, my, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. So get all suited up. The whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, what does that mean? You suit up, the evil day comes, you get hit with it, and you're, you remain standing. It will not take you out. You say, well, what, is that? What, what does the evil day mean? I don't know, but some evil days have come for me, and there's more coming. Somebody wants me dead. Why does the devil want me dead? You know Why? I am a problem and I, can, and I intend to continue to be a problem. That's why. Because I know that that's why I am still here. Why are you still here? Here's a crazy thing to ask yourself. Does the devil really need you dead? Or are you not really a problem in the first place? Uh, don't be wasting demons on them. We got that. That guy's so asleep. He thinks he doesn't even know what's going on. Let's smoke a little more weed and wait till Jesus comes. Get you some Janice Joplin and pass the time away. That's it. What if you put it in gear and now all of a sudden you're getting shot at again? I can tell you something. It ain't a bad way to live. And if they're not shooting at you, you're probably not over the target. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all the stand. Stand therefore, having, <clears throat> by the way, you have to get up first. You can't stand unless you get up. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then verse 16 starts with this, above all. Right? What does that mean? All these other things are important. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Where's your shield of faith? Now, let me tell you something about hell and demons. They don't miss they're all sharpshooters. They don't miss. Okay? So if you're getting shot at, you know what they're going to do? They are going to hit you every time unless there is something between you and, the, and them. And what is that? A shield of faith that is a fire dart extinguisher. Not only does it block you, these shields, Roman shields, were the size of a door. And if you got that door between you and your enemy, you had protection. But this spiritual shield is, is a shield that when the fiery dart hits it, the shield, it doesn't burn the shield. The shield is designed to put out the fiery dart. It's over. Now, you got a shield. If you, if you know, lay it down and go, whoo, well, that was a day. Look at all those fiery darts. Or... 
put out fiery darts. You say, well, they're shooting at me, and it's never going to stop. So either the fiery darts hit your shield and they get put out, or they hit you and take you out. You say, well, I'm a Christian. You can't take me out. Oh, yeah, he can. He can't get you, he can't get you into hell, but he can steal, kill, and destroy. So you say, well, um, I don't have much faith. Then welcome to the, to the fire, firestorm. Get your shield up. Now, how does it work practically? So that log comes at my car, and I think I'm going to die or end up in the hospital, and I don't. And this is where these things fork really quickly. I don't always win these battles, but this is where it splits really quickly. You either go down and say, son of a, what the, you know, you break out into all this reactionary stuff and like, oh, this ain't right, and why does God do this, and blah, 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 you, you erupt and you're cussing and screaming and upset, or you focus and say, okay, Lord, something is going on here. I'm not dead. I'm alive. I know where I'm going. I know what's up. Give me the faith to withstand this attack and push through to the target. And Matt is the target. And you say, well, I, I don't, re- these, you keep talking about these targets, about these people you reach. I never make it. Put your shield up. Put your shield up. Of course the devil is going to try to stop you. You got people praying for Matt maybe his whole life, and over a sink God arranges for me, and I tell people this, and this may sound cocky, when I get with somebody in these situations, I'm, I say, let me tell you something. Someone has been praying for you because when I show up, something's going to happen. I am not here by chance. So if God got me over here over a sink, it's game on, big boy. You say, well, that's arrogant. Why are you here? (laughs) What are you doing? Big difference in being an American and being an American soldier, by the way. Big difference in being a Christian and being a fighting soldier in, in, in God's army. Active duty. Be active duty. Don't be reserved. Well, I just don't see the things happen in my life the way you do. Whatever. Get off your butt and get in the game. Get in the war. God, I'm tired of hearing his stories. I want my stories. And you might get a nice sink out of the deal too. You never know. You know, it's a. Above all, take the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me. Now listen to how he closes this. And for me. Paul's saying, pray for me, that utterance may be given to me, so I want opportunity to speak, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now, this is Paul writing scripture, writing these letters, and he's asking for prayer for boldness. Who needs boldness? What in the world is Paul praying for boldness? Because we all need boldness. I don't care who you are. Because the the devil will try to shut you down. Oh, I'm tired. Not today, Lord. Somebody else will get to him. Boldness to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. I don't know. I'm probably running. I'll probably run everybody off. You're like, oh, well, good for you, dude. We're not doing this. Then I'm, I'm going to keep preaching to people who are interested in this. That's what I'm here for. So I get it. You don't want to hear this anymore. I don't say this casually. Go somewhere else. I'm not interested in babysitting people who don't want to fight. Oh, I like your sermons. Do something with them. Live it. Get in the war. The firemen that we are supposed to be, I am supposed to be a spiritual arsonist. That's what I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be setting the world on fire. Everywhere I go. 
And by the way, Matt didn't hesitate at all. You say, well, you probably talked him into accepting Jesus. No, dude, when the fruit is falling off the tree and you just run and catch it, you didn't even touch the tree. He was ready. The question is, was I? And I was. And you could be too. You just got to pick. The Lord, he is God. And we will obey. And we will follow his commands. And we will trust him. And we'll serve him. And there's just no telling what can happen. We could take the planet if we would just get out of the way. All right, Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for these people in the room and beyond. And you know I'm not really trying to run people off, Lord, but I, I, I struggle so much myself trying to stay out of the way personally. And I, so I know if it's this way for me, it's got to be this way for them to help people stop seeing themselves the way the world sees them or the enemies, whatever the enemies told them, help people see themselves in the light of, of who you are and what you've made them to be and that we all have the same God living in us as, as believers. It's the same Holy Spirit, the same power. And we all can be where you place us every day, and there's nothing by chance. Even if something terrible happens, it's never by chance. Thank you for what you allow, but also thank you for what you don't allow more than we can take. I pray for anybody, Lord, today who does not know you personally. It's, it seems like you're everywhere, but something is still missing inside of, the, of them. And they would say, God, I can't do this anymore. I can't take it anymore. I can't, I can't be by myself anymore. And, and I don't want to live this way. I don't want to die this way. I have no hope. I have no answers. I understand now that you love me, that Jesus died on the cross for me. that his blood was shed, that he was buried, raised from the dead, and he's overcome every obstacle that I face. Sin, the grave, death, Satan, everything. So I need you, God. And I accept the forgiveness of my sins. I ask you to come live in me personally and fill me from the inside out. Save me. rescue me make me clean let me start again let me figure out what you intended do it your way and i'm sure i'll screw up lord because i know plenty of screwed up christians but help me not sustain that kind of life but chase after you to the finish line thank you for saving me today and that i know now that i will spend eternity with you in heaven and that you will never leave me or forsake me between here and there. And that you have a plan and a purpose for my life. Help me discover what it is. Send me help, someone to help me grow. Thank you. And for the believers, Lord, here and wherever they are listening, that would just say, okay, God, I can't promise the rest of my life, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take steps today, maybe for one hour, maybe for the rest of the day, Father, show me how to engage. Light a fire in me. Help me not be lukewarm. Help me be hot after you. And take the steps necessary to live the life that you intended. And use me, Lord. Get, get me some stories of literally seeing the world change through prayer, through conversations, whatever it is, God, I'm yours. You're the best. You're the only. Um, today would be a good day to come back. But on the other hand, you might want to wait because we still got friends that won't make it if you come back today. We won't be here to see it. So Lord, give us, give us life. Give us time. Give us urgency to always be ready to give a reason for the hope that's within us. 
and we worship and praise you and look forward to the day when we get to do it in person. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.